Brought to you by the Praetorian on both YouTube and Facebook. Practical philosophy. Aristotle's practical philosophy covers areas such as ethics, politics, economics, and rhetoric. Just war theory. Aristotelian just war theory is not well regarded in the present day, especially his view that warfare was justified to enslave natural slaves. In Aristotelian philosophy, the abolition of what he considers natural slavery would undermine civic freedom. The pursuit of freedom is inseparable from pursuing mastery over those who deserve to be slaves. According to the Cambridge Companion to Aristotle's politics, the targets of this aggressive warfare were non-Greeks. Noting Aristotle's view that our poets say it is proper for Greeks to rule non-Greeks. Aristotle generally has a favorable opinion of war, extolling it as a chance for virtue and writing that the leisure that accompanies peace tends to make people arrogant. War to avoid becoming enslaved to others is justified as self-defense. He writes that war compels people to be just and temperate, however. In order to be just, war must be chosen for the sake of peace, with the exception of wars of aggression discussed above. Ethics, main article, Aristotelian ethics. Aristotle considered ethics to be a practical rather than theoretical study, i.e., one aimed at becoming good and doing good rather than knowing for its own sake. He wrote several treatises on ethics, including most notably, the Nicomachean Ethics. Aristotle taught that virtue has to do with the proper function, ergon, of a thing. An eye is only a good eye in so much as it can see, because the proper function of an eye is sight. Aristotle reasoned that humans must have a function specific to humans and that this function must be an activity of the suke soul in accordance with reason logos. Aristotle identified such an optimum activity, the virtuous mean, between the accompanying vices of excess or deficiency of the soul as the aim of all human deliberate action, eudaimonia, generally translated as happiness or sometimes well-being. To have the potential of ever being happy in this way necessarily requires a good character, ethique or et, often translated as moral or ethical virtue or excellence. Aristotle taught that to achieve a virtuous and potentially happy character requires a first stage of having the fortune to be habituated not deliberately, but by teachers and experience, leading to a later stage in which one consciously chooses to do the best things. When the best people come to live life this way, their practical wisdom, phronesis, and their intellect, news can develop with each other towards the highest possible human virtue. The wisdom of an accomplished theoretical or speculative thinker, or in other words, a philosopher. Politics. Main article, Politics, Aristotle. In addition to his works on ethics, which address the individual, Aristotle addressed the city in his work titled Politics. Aristotle considered the city to be a natural community. Moreover, he considered the city to be prior in importance to the family which in turn is prior to the individual, for the whole must of necessity be prior to the part. He also famously stated that man is by nature a political animal and also arguing that humanity's defining factor among others in the animal kingdom is its rationality. Aristotle conceived of politics as being like an organism rather than like a machine, and as a collection of parts none of which can exist without the others. Aristotle's conception of the city is organic, and he is considered one of the first to conceive of the city in this manner. The common modern understanding of a political community as a modern state is quite different from Aristotle's understanding. Although he was aware of the existence and potential of larger empires, the natural community according to Aristotle was the city, polis, which functions as a political community or partnership, koinonia. The aim of the city is not just to avoid injustice or for economic stability, but rather to allow at least some citizens the possibility to live a good life. And to perform beautiful acts, the political partnership must be regarded, therefore, as being for the sake of noble actions. 
not for the sake of living together. This is distinguished from modern approaches beginning with social contract theory, according to which individuals leave the state of nature because of fear of violent death or its inconveniences. In Protrepticus, the character Aristotle states, for we all agree that the most excellent man should rule, i.e., the supreme by nature, and that the law rules and alone is authoritative. But the law is a kind of intelligence, i.e. a discourse based on intelligence. And again, what standard do we have? What criterion of good things that is more precise than the intelligent man? For all that this man will choose, if the choice is based on his knowledge, are good things and their contraries are bad. And since everybody chooses most of all what conforms to their own proper dispositions, a just man choosing to live justly, a man with bravery to live bravely. Likewise a self-controlled man to live with self-control, it is clear that the intelligent man will choose most of all to be intelligent. For this is a function of that capacity. Hence, it's evident that, according to the most authoritative judgment, intelligence is supreme among goods. Economics. Main article, Politics, Aristotle. Aristotle made substantial contributions to economic thought, especially to thought in the Middle Ages. In politics, Aristotle addresses the city, property, and trade. His response to criticisms of private property, in Lionel Robbins's view, anticipated later proponents of private property among philosophers and economists, as it related to the overall utility of social arrangements. Aristotle believed that although communal arrangements may seem beneficial to society, and that although private property is often blamed for social strife, such evils in fact come from human nature. In politics, Aristotle offers one of the earliest accounts of the origin of money. Money came into use because people became dependent on one another, importing what they needed and exporting the surplus. For the sake of convenience, people then agreed to deal in something that is intrinsically useful and easily applicable, such as iron or silver. Aristotle's discussions on retail and interest was a major influence on economic thought in the Middle Ages. He had a low opinion of retail, believing that contrary to using money to procure things one needs in managing the household, retail trade seeks to make a profit. He thus uses goods as a means to an end, rather than as an end unto itself. He believed that retail trade was in this way unnatural. Similarly, Aristotle considered making a profit through interest unnatural, as it makes a gain out of the money itself, and not from its use. Aristotle gave a summary of the function of money that was perhaps remarkably precocious for his time. He wrote that because it is impossible to determine the value of every good through account of the number of other goods it is worth, the necessity arises of a single universal standard of measurement. Money thus allows for the association of different goods and makes them commensurable. He goes on to state that money is also useful for future exchange, making it a sort of security. That is, if we do not want a thing now, we shall be able to get it when we do want it. Rhetoric and Poetics Main Articles Rhetoric Aristotle and Poetics Aristotle Aristotle's rhetoric proposes that a speaker can use three basic kinds of appeals to persuade his audience, ethos, an appeal to the speaker's character, pathos, an appeal to the audience's emotion, and logos, an appeal to logical reasoning. He also categorizes rhetoric into three genres, epideictic, ceremonial speeches dealing with praise or blame, forensic, judicial speeches over guilt or innocence, and deliberative speeches calling on an audience to make a decision on an issue. Aristotle also outlines two kinds of rhetorical proofs, enthymeme, proof by syllogism, and paradigma, proof by example. Aristotle writes in his Poetics that epic poetry, tragedy, comedy, dithyrambic poetry, painting, sculpture, music, and dance are all fundamentally acts of mimesis, imitation, each varying in imitation by medium, object, and manner. He applies the term mimesis both as a property of a work of art and also as the product of the artist's intention and contends that the audience's realization of the mimesis is vital to understanding the work itself. Aristotle states that mimesis is a natural instinct of humanity that separates humans from animals and that all human artistry follows the pattern of nature. 
Because of this, Aristotle believed that each of the mimetic arts possesses what Stephen Halliwell calls highly structured procedures for the achievement of their purposes. For example, music imitates with the media of rhythm and harmony, whereas dance imitates with rhythm alone, and poetry with language. The forms also differ in their object of imitation. Comedy, for instance, is a dramatic imitation of men worse than average, whereas tragedy imitates men slightly better than average. Lastly, the forms differ in their manner of imitation, through narrative or character, through change or no change, and through drama or no drama. While it is believed that Aristotle's poetics originally comprised two books, one on comedy and one on tragedy, only the portion that focuses on tragedy has survived. Aristotle taught that tragedy is composed of six elements, plot structure, character, style, thought, spectacle, and lyric poetry. The characters in a tragedy are merely a means of driving the story, and the plot, not the characters, is the chief focus of tragedy. Tragedy is the imitation of action arousing pity and fear, and is meant to affect the catharsis of those same emotions. Aristotle concludes poetics with a discussion on which, if either, is superior, epic or tragic mimesis. He suggests that because tragedy possesses all the attributes of an epic, possibly possesses additional attributes such as spectacle and music is more unified and achieves the aim of its mimesis in shorter scope, it can be considered superior to epic. Aristotle was a keen systematic collector of riddles, folklore, and proverbs. He and his school had a special interest in the riddles of the Delphic Oracle and studied the fables of Aesop. Views on Women Main article, Aristotle's Views on Women Further information, Aristotle's Biology Section Inheritance Aristotle's analysis of procreation describes an active and souling masculine element bringing life to an inert, passive female element. On this ground, proponents of feminist metaphysics have accused Aristotle of misogyny and sexism. However, Aristotle gave equal weight to women's happiness as he did to men's, and commented in his rhetoric that the things that lead to happiness need to be in women as well as men. Influence. Further information, list of writers influenced by Aristotle. More than 2,300 years after his death, Aristotle remains one of the most influential people who ever lived. He contributed to almost every field of human knowledge then in existence, and he was the founder of many new fields. According to the philosopher Brian Moggy, it is doubtful whether any human being has ever known as much as he did. Among countless other achievements, Aristotle was the founder of formal logic, pioneered the study of zoology, and left every future scientist and philosopher in his debt through his contributions to the scientific method. Tan Eli Kukinen, writing in the classical tradition, observes that his achievement in founding two sciences is unmatched and his reach in influencing every branch of intellectual enterprise, including Western ethical and political theory, theology, rhetoric, and literary analysis is equally long. As a result, Kukinen argues, any analysis of reality today will almost certainly carry Aristotelian overtones. Evidence of an exceptionally forceful mind, Jonathan Barnes wrote that an account of Aristotle's intellectual afterlife would be little less than a history of European thought. On his successor, Theophrastus. Main articles, Theophrastus and Historia Plantarum, Theophrastus. Aristotle's pupil and successor, Theophrastus, wrote the history of plants, a pioneering work in botany. Some of his technical terms remain in use, such as carpal from carpos, fruit, and pericarp from pericarpian, seed chamber. Theophrastus was much less concerned with formal causes than Aristotle was instead pragmatically describing how plants functioned on later Greek philosophers. Further information, Peripatetic School. The immediate influence of Aristotle's work was felt as the Lyceum grew into the Peripatetic School. Aristotle's notable students include Aristoxenus, Dicearchus, Demetrius of Phalerim, Eudemos of Rhodes, Harapalas, Hephaestion, Minosin of Phasis, Nicomachus, and Theophrastus. Aristotle's influence over Alexander the Great is seen in the latter's bringing with him on his expedition a host of zoologists, botanists, and researchers. He had also learned a great deal about Persian customs and traditions from his teacher. 
Although his respect for Aristotle was diminished as his travels made it clear that much of Aristotle's geography was clearly wrong when the old philosopher released his works to the public. Alexander complained thou hast not done well to publish thy acronomatic doctrines. For in what shall I surpass other men if those doctrines wherein I have been trained are to be all men's common property? On Hellenistic Science Further Information Ancient Greek Medicine After Theophrastus, the Lyceum failed to produce any original work. Though interest in Aristotle's ideas survived, they were generally taken unquestioningly. It is not until the age of Alexandria under the Ptolemies that advances in biology can be again found. The first medical teacher at Alexandria, Theophilus of Chalcedon, corrected Aristotle, placing intelligence in the brain, and connected the nervous system to motion and sensation. Theophilus also distinguished between veins and arteries, noting that the latter pulse while the former do not. Though a few ancient atomists such as Lucretius challenged the teleological viewpoint of Aristotelian ideas about life, teleology, and after the rise of Christianity, Natural theology would remain central to biological thought essentially until the 18th and 19th centuries. Ernst Meyer states that there was nothing of any real consequence in biology after Lucretius and Galen until the Renaissance. On Byzantine scholars, see also commentaries on Aristotle and Byzantine Aristotelianism. Greek Christian scribes played a crucial role in the preservation of Aristotle by copying all the extant Greek language manuscripts of the corpus. The first Greek Christians to comment extensively on Aristotle were Philipponus, Elias, and David in the 6th century, and Stephen of Alexandria in the early 7th century. John Philipponus stands out for having attempted a fundamental critique of Aristotle's views on the eternity of the world, movement, and other elements of Aristotelian thought. Philipponus questioned Aristotle's teaching of physics, noting its flaws and introducing the theory of impetus to explain his observations. After a hiatus of several centuries, formal commentary by Eustratius and Michael of Ephesus reappeared in the late 11th and early 12th centuries, apparently sponsored by Anna Komnena. On the Medieval Islamic World Further Information, Logic in Islamic Philosophy and Transmission of the Greek Classics Aristotle was one of the most revered Western thinkers in early Islamic theology. Most of the still extant works of Aristotle, as well as a number of the original Greek commentaries, were translated into Arabic and studied by Muslim philosophers, scientists, and scholars. Averroes, Avicenna, and Alpharabius, who wrote on Aristotle in great depth, also influenced Thomas Aquinas and other Western Christian scholastic philosophers. Alcindus greatly admired Aristotle's philosophy, and Averroes spoke of Aristotle as the exemplar for all future philosophers. Medieval Muslim scholars regularly described Aristotle as the first teacher. The title, teacher, was first given to Aristotle by Muslim scholars, and was later used by Western philosophers, as in the famous poem of Dante, who were influenced by the tradition of Islamic philosophy. On Medieval Europe Woodcut of Aristotle written by Phyllis by Hans Baldung, 1515. Further information, Aristotelianism and Syllogism section medieval. With the loss of the study of ancient Greek and the early medieval Latin West. Aristotle was practically unknown there from c. 8600 to c. 1100 except through the Latin translation of the Organon made by Boethius. In the 12th and 13th centuries, interest in Aristotle revived and Latin Christians had translations made, both from Arabic translations, such as those by Gerard of Cremona, and from the original Greek, such as those by James of Venice and William of Morbeck. After the scholastic, Thomas Aquinas wrote his Summa Theologica, working from Morbeck's translations and calling Aristotle, the philosopher, the demand for Aristotle's writings grew, and the Greek manuscripts returned to the West stimulating a revival of Aristotelianism in Europe that continued into the Renaissance. These thinkers blended Aristotelian philosophy with Christianity, bringing the thought of ancient Greece into the Middle Ages. Scholars such as Boethius, Peter Abelard, and John Buridan worked on Aristotelian logic. The medieval English poet Chaucer describes his student as being happy by having 
At his better seed, 20 books clad in black are read for Aristotle and his philosophy. A cautionary medieval tale held that Aristotle advised his pupil Alexander to avoid the king's seductive mistress Phyllis, but was himself captivated by her and allowed her to ride him. Phyllis had secretly told Alexander what to expect and he witnessed Phyllis proving that a woman's charms could overcome even the greatest philosopher's male intellect. Artists such as Hans Baldung produced a series of illustrations of the popular theme. The Italian poet Dante says of Aristotle in the Divine Comedy, Dante, Inferna, Canto IV, 131-135 translation. Hell. Vidi, El Maestro di Color Che Sano, Sater Tra Filosofica Familia. Tutti lo miran, tutti onor li fano, chi video secreti platone, che non zia li altri più presso li stano. I saw the master there of those who know, amid the philosophic family, by all admired, and by all reverenced, their Plato too I saw, and Socrates, who stood beside him closer than the rest. On early modern scientists. In the early modern period, scientists such as William Harvey in England and Galileo Galilei in Italy reacted against the theories of Aristotle and other classical era thinkers like Galen, establishing new theories based to some degree on observation and experiment. Harvey demonstrated the circulation of the blood, establishing that the heart functioned as a pump rather than being the seat of the soul and the controller of the body's heat. As Aristotle thought, Galileo used more doubtful arguments to displace Aristotle's physics, proposing that bodies all fall at the same speed whatever their weight. On 19th century thinkers, the 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche has been said to have taken nearly all of his political philosophy from Aristotle. Aristotle rigidly separated action from production and argued for the deserved subservience of some people, natural slaves, and the natural superiority, virtue, ret, of others. It was Martin Heidegger, not Nietzsche, who elaborated a new interpretation of Aristotle and tended to warrant his deconstruction of scholastic and philosophical tradition. The English mathematician George Boole fully accepted Aristotle's logic, but decided to go under, over, and beyond it with his system of algebraic logic in his 1854 book The Laws of Thought. This gives logic a mathematical foundation with equations, enables it to solve equations as well as check validity, and allows it to handle a wider class of problems by expanding propositions of any number of terms, not just two. Modern rejection and rehabilitation, that most enduring of romantic images, Aristotle tutoring the future conqueror Alexander. Illustration by Charles Laplante, FR, 1866. During the 20th century, Aristotle's work was widely criticized. The philosopher Bertrand Russell argued that almost every serious intellectual advance has had to begin with an attack on some Aristotelian doctrine. Russell called Aristotle's ethics repulsive and labeled his logic as definitely antiquated as Ptolemaic astronomy. Russell stated that these errors made it difficult to do historical justice to Aristotle until one remembered what an advance he made upon all of his predecessors. The Dutch historian of science Eduard Jan Dijksterhuis wrote that Aristotle and his predecessors showed the difficulty of science by proceed ink so readily to frame a theory of such a general character on limited evidence from their senses. In 1985, the biologist Peter Medawar did still state in pure 17th century tones that Aristotle had assembled a strange and generally speaking rather tiresome farrago of hearsay, imperfect observation, wishful thinking on credulity amounting to downright gullibility. By the start of the 21st century, however, Aristotle was taken more seriously. Kukinen noted that, in the best 20th century scholarship, Aristotle comes alive as a thinker wrestling with the full weight of the Greek. Philosophical tradition, Ayn Rand accredited Aristotle as the greatest philosopher in history and cited him as a major influence on her thinking. More recently, Alastair McIntyre has attempted to reform what he calls the Aristotelian tradition in a way that is anti-elitist and capable of disputing the claims of both liberals and Nietzscheans. 
who can and observe, too, that at most enduring of romantic images, Aristotle tutoring the future conqueror Alexander remained current as in the 2004 film Alexander. While the firm rules of Aristotle's theory of drama have ensured a role for the poetics in Hollywood, biologists continue to be interested in Aristotle's thinking. Armand Marie Leroy has reconstructed Aristotle's biology, while Nico Tinbergen's four questions, based on Aristotle's four causes, are used to analyze animal behavior. They examine function, phylogeny, mechanism, and ontogeny. Surviving works, Corpus Aristotelicum, main article, Corpus Aristotelicum. The works of Aristotle that have survived from antiquity through medieval manuscript transmission are collected in the Corpus Aristotelicum. These texts, as opposed to Aristotle's lost works, are technical philosophical treatises from within Aristotle's school. Reference to them has made according to the organization of Emanuel Becker's Royal Prussian Academy edition, Aristoteles Opera Edited at Academia Regia Borussica, Berlin, 1831-1870 which in turn is based on ancient classifications of these works. Loss and preservation. Further information, recovery of Aristotle. Aristotle wrote his works on papyrus scrolls, the common writing medium of that era. His writings are divisible into two groups, the exoteric, intended for the public, and the esoteric, for use within the Lyceum school. Aristotle's lost work stray considerably in characterization from the surviving Aristotelian corpus. Whereas the lost works appear to have been originally written with a view to subsequent publication, the surviving works mostly resemble lecture notes not intended for publication. Cicero's description of Aristotle's literary style as a river of gold must have applied to the published works, not the surviving notes. A major question in the history of Aristotle's works is how the exoteric writings were all lost and how the ones we now possess came to us. The consensus is that Andronicus of Rhodes collected the esoteric works of Aristotle's school which existed in the form of smaller, separate works, distinguished them from those of Theophrastus and other peripatetics, edited them, and finally compiled them into the more cohesive, larger works as they are known today. This is brought to you by The Praetorian, on both YouTube and Facebook. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed, please like, subscribe, share, and make comments. We love feedback.